buying a new bike is bloody expensive. So don't do that. And instead, here's eight things or 10 or seven or an amount of things that I've done to my bike to make it better. Better than a new one could ever be. And they're all quite cost effective. I have a bit of a grudge against butyl inner tubes. You know, the heavy cheap ones that come with just about every bike on the market. Now, I'm not here to start an argument about whether you should, should or should not go tubeless, but literally all the alternatives are better than butyl. On this bike, because it's been used during the winter and I don't want to puncture and that sort of thing, I have set it up tubeless. But I'm also a fan of latex inner tubes, which are lighter and comfier than butyl inner tubes, but do need pumping up more regularly. And then there's TPU tubes, which again are lighter, roll faster, and feel better than butyl. Therefore, any one of these three options is a great value for money upgrade that's just begging to be made. Fitting lights on your bike is one of the best ways to improve your safety out on the road. Personally, I always found fitting them a bit of a faff, but since I've fitted mounts, I'm far more likely to head out the door with a front and rear light flasher fitted. Now this one, I just leave the mount fitted to my bike. Can't get the light off now like that and then I charge up the little light and then when I go riding I just fit it. That means that if I spend too long chatting at the cafe and then have to ride home at dusk then I'm not going to get caught out by the receding light or if my ride takes an unexpected turn into a cloud of fog or bright sunlight then I've always got that peace of mind that I'm going to be more visible than without lights. There is no such thing as the perfect gearing, as everyone likes to ride at a different cadence and on different terrain. Even the pros can't agree on what's best on any one stage. It's fairly unlikely then that the gearing that your bike comes with is the perfect equipment for you. And for relatively little money, you can tune it to better suit your needs. If you find yourself running out of gears, then it's quite likely that you'll be able to fit a bigger set to your bike or on the other hand, if you never touch the last few gears, then you could go for a closer range cassette to narrow down the jumps and therefore have a better chance of finding a more comfortable cadence. The benefit of having the right gearing on your bike can't be overstated. It can improve your efficiency, your comfort, power, and it, in extreme cases, even prevent injuries. Now, if you'd like to watch a video on whether I think one bike is the future, then click the card up there. The only thing that connects your bike to the tarmac or gravel is hopefully the tires. So getting the right ones for your riding is crucial. With new tires, you can improve grip in crappy weather, go a bit faster, add some much needed comfort or simply reduce your risk of puncturing. What you buy depends on the riding that you're gonna be doing as no tires have mastered the art of balancing speed, puncture protection and durability. A softer compound as found on performance focused tires is better suited to summer riding as they're faster, but with the trade-off of less puncture protection. Harder compounds trade off some grip in return for being longer lasting. Most modern road bikes will now take at least 28 mil tires, but for winter and B road riding, I've opted for these 30 mil tires for added comfort. These particular ones are Vittoria Corsa controls, which the pros use for the classics, races over cobblestones and mucky lanes. I find that they give a great balance of speed, durability and puncture protection, but your ideal combination might compromise elsewhere. One of the nicest feelings on a new bike is a silent and crisp drivetrain, but there's no reason why you can't get your current bike running a little bit sweeter. During the summer months, I choose to wax my chain as it creates a friction reducing coating that repels dirt and grime and I found it to be much cleaner than most drip lubes. A clean and well lubricated chain will be quieter, smoother, and help to extend component life. Apparently, it will also save you a few watts, which I will happily take. Now, I realize that waxing is a bit of an ordeal, especially if you've not done it before, but regularly replacing your chain and keeping it clean and lubricated will prevent annoying squeaks and help your bike feel a whole lot fresher. If you've got a bit more money to play with, then the classic way to improve a stock road or gravel bike is to upgrade the wheels, as quite often this is an area that the manufacturer has looked to save some pennies. Before buying a set of wheels, consider what you want the wheels to do other than go round. For example, most of my rides are flat, so I went for something quite deep and aero. 
However, if you regularly ride the hills or mountains, then something shallower and lighter might be the way to go. It's also worth considering the internal width and whether that will play nicely with your tyres of choice. I went for these 60mm Hunt Limitless wheels because they're rather good value compared to lots of other premium wheel sets and I've also been impressed with their stability in crosswinds thanks to this super wide front profile. If you want a wheel set to ride year round then maybe consider looking at higher spoke count wheels or ones with brass nipples as these won't corrode in salty conditions. Don't discount wheels with aluminium rims either. They can often be competitively light and a decent upgrade over many stock wheel sets. In fact, I would happily take some of the top aluminium wheel sets over all manner of carbon alternatives. These days, you'll be generally looking at spending between the 400 and 800 pound mark for a meaningful upgrade, and you can find some of our top picks in the buyer's guide linked in the description. If you're a performance-minded rider, then the ultimate bike upgrade you can make might be a power meter. I don't actually have a power meter fitted to this bike, but we're going to ignore that. These days they come in all shapes and sizes, but the one common feature is that they've all come down in price quite a bit. A power meter is the most accurate way to gauge your effort and is more reliable than using heart rate data because it's less affected by external factors such as fatigue. Obviously, power meters are just a tool and they're not instantly going to make you faster, but they can help with pacing on longer efforts and give you lots of data to analyze when you get back, if you're into that sort of thing. Rather than try and judge myself against mates who are horrendously erratic with their training or on time sections, which can be made or broken by a headwind, I now always like to train with a power meter so that I can see how my efforts stack up to previous efforts and years regardless of the conditions. Bikes can very often cost as much as a car, but unlike those sizable blocks of metal, they don't have locks and are much harder to track if they get into the wrong hands. Adding a covert air tag to your bike can increase the likelihood of recovering your bike or add peace of mind if you regularly travel with it. An air tag is particularly useful if you like to ride in towns or cities or like to leave your bike unattended during stops on long rides. But please don't do that. You're just asking for trouble. There are now all manner of accessories to help you store them from ones which mount under your bottle cage, ones under your saddle, and even ones which hide the tag inside tubeless tires for everyone with high volume tires. Now, I'm not gonna tell you where my air tag is, but you can have a guess in the comments below. Let us know if you'll be making any of these upgrades as well as any of your favorites that we've missed down in the comments section below. So, there you have it. Eight upgrades, it was eight. Good job it's got an air tag.